Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying what an honor it is for me to be able to participate in this important conference. And I would like to thank EFAD and the Ministry for Economics and Finance for letting me into your conference and, and letting me participate. I thought that today I would tell you about uh, a topic that I've been working on in my own research, and that is the connection between globalization and inequality in emerging economies. Uh, I don't have to tell you that we've been living in an era of amazing globalization. Uh, over the last 20 years, there has been a tremendous increase in trade of goods and services across international boundaries. But another feature of this globalization is that the production process itself has been internationalized. And this is a point that I will be coming back to very soon. Why has this globalization occurred? Well, there are several reasons. First, a decline in transport costs, but perhaps even more important, a decline in communication costs. It's now possible to organize an international company uh, by communicating with people on the other side of the globe almost costlessly. And then finally, uh, we've removed trade barriers. The, the European Union is an example of a successful uh, economic cooperation. Tra uh, it, of course, it's much more than just a, an, econ uh, an economic cooperative. Uh, in Southeast Asia, we have ASEAN, and in North America, we have NAFTA. Uh, all of these organizations have contributed to globalization. Now, globalization has brought with it many promises. Uh, it ha its proponents have told us that globalization would bring prosperity to emerging economies. On this score, it has actually been a tremendous success. We have only to look at the examples of China and India to see how far globalization can take uh, a country in just the span of 25 or 30 years. But globalization has also made another promise to reduce the gap between the haves and the have-nots in emerging economies. And that's a promise which sadly has not been delivered on. In fact, in many emerging economies, and China and India are again perhaps the leading examples, just the opposite has happened. We have seen an increase in inequality. And it's usually those people living in rural areas especially those working in agriculture who have been left behind by globalization. Now, of course, these days, inequality is a big political topic. It's big in Europe. Brexit had much to do with inequality. The election of Donald Trump in the United States had much to do with inequality. The rise of Marina Le Pen in France but my concern today, as I've already suggested, is not with inequality in rich countries, important though that is, but inequality in emerging economies. Now, why does inequality matter so much in emerging economies? Well, perhaps I don't need to convince this audience on that point, but let, let me just make a a couple of remarks. First, there's a moral argument against inequality. Uh, we, we believe that all people should be treated equally, which doesn't necessarily mean that they will all 
end up equally rich, but does mean that huge variations in opportunity, in economic opportunity, are morally repugnant. But even if we don't accept this moral argument, we may be interested in the eradication of poverty. But poverty is very closely tied to inequality. If we fight poverty, we are also fighting economic inequality. So simply from the standpoint of poverty eradication, we should care about inequality. And then there's a third, more practical reason for worrying about inequality, which is there's a well-known correlation between countries where there's increasing inequality and political instability. So simply for the sake of keeping the social fabric, the political fabric together, we must do something uh, about rising inequality. Now one might ask, should we be surprised that the recent globalization has led to rising inequality in emerging economies? Is the fact that agricultural workers in particular are getting left behind something that was unanticipated? Well, interestingly, the answer to that question is yes, because the theory of comparative advantage, which is probably the best established theory within economics and goes back 200 years, predicts just the opposite. David Ricardo, who was the first to propose the theory of comparative advantage, erected a theory which has been enormously successful in explaining international trade patterns and in all previous globalizations, and I should point out that this is by no means the first globalization the world has experienced, comparative advantage theory predicted correctly that free trade would reduce inequality in emerging economies. Now because that point is so important, let me take a few minutes to describe why comparative advantage theory suggests that inequality should be reduced. According to the theory of comparative advantage, the important differences between countries are their endowments of the factors of production. Factors of production are the inputs into the production process. And the most important input into production is labor. So let, let's imagine two kinds of labor. There are high-skill workers and there are low-skill workers. And what I want to do is a little thought experiment. Let's imagine that there is a rich country and a poor country. And at first, the rich country and the poor country cannot trade with one another. But then the door to trade is opened. What I want to do is to explore how opening the door to trade affects production patterns in those two countries. And in that way, we can see how opening the door to trade will affect inequality. Now, why is the country, the, it, why is the rich country rich? It's rich because it has a higher proportion of high skill workers. The, the most important factor that any country has is its endowment of skilled workers. So the rich country is rich because of its highly skilled workers. That means that it has a comparative advantage producing goods where a high proportion of high-skill work, uh, high-skill labor is required. Um, an example of such a uh, 
such a good is computer software. Computer software doesn't require much by way of low-skill worker. The emerging economy, the, the poor country, has a comparative advantage producing goods where skill doesn't matter so much. And agricultural goods, such as rice, often fall into this category. What will happen before the rich country and poor country can trade with one another? Well, before globalization, people in the rich country will want both software and rice, and so companies in the rich country will have to produce both software and rice, and the same thing will be true in the poor country. Uh, there will be both software and rice production. But there's a sense in which producing software in the poor country is inefficient because that country's labor force, from the, from the point of view of the theory of comparative advantage, is better suited to producing rice. In fact, low-skill workers in the poor country are actually hurt by the, the diversion of resources away from rice toward software. These workers are not needed very much for software. They're greatly needed for rice. And if production is being concentrated more in software, that means that the demand for low-skill worker, uh, low-skill labor, is reduced. And it means that low-skill wages will be relatively low. Similarly, high-skill labor in the, in the poor country will benefit from the software production and will see relatively high wages. Now, what happens once the rich country and poor country are able to trade with one another? What happens once globalization occurs? Well, the rich country can now shift production away from rice to software and import the rice from the emerging economy. And the emerging economy can do just the opposite. It can shift production from software to rice and import the software from the rich country. So the emerging economy is now producing more rice less software than before. And this raises the demand for low-skill workers because rice uses low-skill workers more intensively than, than software does. So the demand for low-skill labor is higher. That pushes up their wage. Now that less software is being produced, the demand for high-skill labor is going down so their wages fall and inequality is reduced. That is, what I've just given you is the standard argument, according to the theory of comparative advantage, for why globalization should reduce inequality in poor, in, in poor countries and why agricultural workers in particular should benefit from globalization. Well, as I said, the theory of comparative advantage has been remarkably successful historically over the last 200 years. For example, there was an important globalization in the late 19th century. This involved a dramatic increase in trade across the Atlantic between Europe and North America. It became much cheaper to ship goods uh, across the Atlantic. At that time, Europe had a relative abundance of low-skill labor. And just as the theory predicted, we saw a significant decrease in inequality in Europe at that time. So the theory got things right for that globalization and actually for several other globalizations. It's been less successful for the current globalization. And that led me and a, a colleague of mine at Harvard, Michael Kramer, to try to puzzle out what is different 
about the current globalization as compared to previous ones. And that led us to develop an alternative theory. This is not a theory which is intended to replace the theory of comparative advantage, but certainly to supplement it. And the argument that we make is that the notable feature about the current globalization is that it has led to a dramatic increase in international production itself. So, so the production process is now truly global. And, and, and to see that, think of a good like computers. Computers may be designed in the US and programmed in Europe and assembled in China. So, so the very process of putting a computer together involves coordination across international boundaries. And this is just one of thousands upon thousands, probably millions of goods which are now truly international uh, in their production process. Now, f that suggests that our theory should concentrate on production, the production process itself as the key to globalization. In, in our view, um, you should think of a company as, a, as a, 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 a production process as consisting of different tasks. To make matters simple, let's suppose that there are just two tasks that have to be performed in order to get output. There's a ma managerial task, which is highly sensitive to skill, and there's a subordinate task, which is less sensitive to skill. We get outputs when we put people in these different tasks. When we put a manager in the managerial task and a subordinate in the subordinate task. And the amount of output that we get will depend on the skill levels of the people occupying those jobs. We want the person in the managerial task to be someone of higher skill than the person in the subordinate task, but we don't want the difference between the skill levels to be too big, otherwise the high skill of the manager is just going to go to waste. So how does this kind of thinking apply to the sort of two country example that I was talking about before? Let's, let's once again imagine that there's a rich country and a poor country. And once again, the rich country is rich because it has workers of higher skill. For my purposes now, it's going to be necessary to imagine that there are four levels of skill, not just two. Let's imagine that there's high skill, there's what we might call uh, a good level of skill, there's average skill, and there's low skill. And the rich country is rich because it has workers of high and good skills. The poor country is poor because it has workers mostly of average and low skill. Now before globalization, it's impossible to have production across international boundaries. So that means that in the rich country will have the high skill workers being matched with the workers of good, of good skill level. And in the poor country, we'll have the workers of average skill being matched with the low skill workers. So the average skill people will be in the managerial position, the low skill people will be in the subordinate position. But what happens once globalization occurs? Once globalization occurs, the labor market itself 
is now tr global, and a, a company can hire people from, from any country. Uh, the company is not confined to hiring people just in its own country. Well, um, that's going to tend to bring the average skill workers from the, from the poor country into the global labor market. They're going to have plenty of employment opportunities. But the low skill workers, the workers with very little skill in the poor country, are going to be left behind. Because their, because their skills are simply too low or non-existent for them to be attractive to the global labor market. Well, what implication does this have for inequality? Before globalization, these low-skill workers benefited from being matched, from, from working with the average skill workers. You probably know from your own experience, if you're working with, with somebody else who is more highly skilled than you, that increases your own productivity. It's always good to, to work with highly skilled people. And the low-skill workers will benefit here too, they will see a boost to their wages. But after globalization, when the average skill workers have these new opportunities and the low skill workers are left to themselves, the low skill workers will see a decline in their productivity and therefore a decline, or at least a stagnation, of their wages. So, Low-skill workers will decline or, at best, stay the same. What happens to the average skill workers? Well, they have these new employment opportunities. They're the, one, they're the, the big beneficiaries of globalization. They see their wages rise. And so inequality increases in the emerging economy. Well, that very briefly is the point of view that we take in our work as a counterbalance to the traditional theory of comparative advantage. And it has a strong policy implication because it means that if you want to do something about inequality, you have to do something to raise the skill level through job training or education of low-skill workers so that they have international job opportunities too. The problem is that skill training and education are expensive. Someone has to pay for them. Who's, who's going to pay? Well, the, the workers themselves can't do that. They can't afford to. We're talking about the poorest people in the world. But neither should we anticipate that employers are going to pay for this skill training because if I'm a low-skill worker and you're an employer who is considering hiring me, well, if you give me training, I can then go to work for your competitor, in which case your investment in me is lost. So typically employers are, are not going to have sufficient incentive on their own to train low-skill workers. And that means that there is a, an essential role for investment in skills by some third party. This third party could be governments, could be international agencies or NGOs, it could be foreign aid, it could even be private foundations, but someone has to do it. Now, what form might this investment take? Well, um, NGOs could directly train 
farm workers and subsistence agriculture uh, in modern agricultural techniques. And of course, this is already being done to some extent, uh, but as the president pointed out, uh, not to a, a sufficient extent. Governments could give tax breaks to garment manufacturers to teach rural women in Cambodia how to sew together beautiful skirts for export and to, to do this work in their own homes so that they can continue to, uh, so that they don't have to leave their families. And this is being done to some extent, but not nearly enough. Poor families in Brazil can be given conditional cash transfers in exchange for sending their children to school. Under normal circumstances, the families can't afford to send their children to school because they're needed to work on the family farm. The transfers free the family up to allow the children to go to school, and the schooling enables the children to learn skills that ultimately can lift them and their families um, out of poverty. These are only some of a huge variety of imaginative ways that low-skill workers can have their skills upgraded and have a chance at a better life. Notice that none of these policies are anti-globalization. It would be a big mistake to try to stop globalization, even if that were possible, because globalization, as I said at the outset, has been such a powerful force for increasing prosperity. The problem with globalization is not that it hasn't increased prosperity, but that it's only increased prosperity for people who already have some skills to offer. So it's up to us to make sure that globalization works for everybody and works in particular for the low-skilled workers of the world. Thank you.